So what can go wrong? Tissue damage. So heart is actually, while it's inside, in like big accidents, like car accidents or something, your bone can actually hit the heart muscle and cause contusions. So you can get direct trauma, which will destroy the muscle a little bit. It can heal over time. Uh, infections. So there's three layers of the heart, which we didn't go over, but each of them can get infected. Valves can get infected, so heart tissue can get damaged from infection. And then other causes, like drugs. Cocaine, I've seen so many patients in the county hospital who are addicted to cocaine and their heart gets destroyed by the age of 30. It's terrible. Um, amphetamines, I think, can sometimes do it, I think, if abused incorrectly, but not that much as cocaine. Cocaine is probably the worst one. Ischemic damage. Cocaine constricts your coronary circulation. And as you know, if your circulation constricts, you get less blood than you need. And your heart tissue gets slowly, slowly ischemic damage and causes heart failure. It's kind of like having coronary artery disease from plaques, but not having plaques and having the same effect. So cocaine is not good for anybody. I hope none of you do it. Uh, coronary occlusions is just plaques in the vessels, which can be from stuff that shoots out, like an embolus from the valve. Sometimes valves can develop like vegetations and flicker out into the vessel and block it. Or you can have people like in the obesity lecture when we studied like diabetes and atherosclerosis from high cholesterol, high, high sugar levels, the, the t plaques start building at the side of vessels and then it clogs. And once it clogs completely, then it's a heart attack. Uh, aneurysms is a kind of outpouching of big vessels or small vessels, mostly arteries. Valve problems, which we talked about stenosis, we talked about one. Regurgitation is the opposite of stenosis, where valves are not tight, but leaky. And then electrical abnormalities, where there's issues in the, the green pathway of electrical conduction that we studied. So this is just kind of statistics from before. I didn't update them, because uh, it would take a while to find these. But basically, it's gotten worse, not better. Take home point between 2008 and 2013. So I won't belabor it, but everyone knows that heart disease is a big big issue in the country. So what happens in plaques build up is the effective area of blood flow in the vessel decreases, correct? From physics, you know that when that happens, you can get turbulent blood flow. So that's not good, right? Secondly, you get less blood flow. That's not good either, because the heart needs blood to work. So people who start developing heart disease when they're old start getting chest pain. All chest pain is not a heart attack. If you're lucky and you're getting heart disease, you'll begin with angina, so someone will know that, oh, you're starting on that track. Let's put you on meds. Let's get you taken care of so you don't get a heart attack, right? Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes people just get heart attacks straight away. So heart attack is when it completely blocks the vessel. In angina, it's just plaque buildup, which causes ischemic pain, like pain when a 70-year-old man is jogging which he does not used to get before, but now he started getting chest pain. It's like, oh, your arteries are not functioning as well. Your heart's getting less blood when you're jogging. That's like the first sign usually. And then in myocardial infarction is when the artery gets fully clogged. In that case, your tissue is not getting any blood supply at all. That's dangerous and life-threatening. So you got to go to the hospital, get that clot taken out, and you live. But if you don't get it taken out, then that's not good. Uh, it's referred pain sometimes, and sometimes um, it's referred pain, right? Yeah, it's just the innervation. Sometimes when the when the heart gets ischemic in the points near the diaphragm, you get pain closer to that diaphragm area. The diaphragm area has neural innervation from the cervical nerves, which are C5, 6, 7, I think. Arms in heaven? No, 3, 4, 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. C3, 4, 5, so yeah, so from the neck. And so essentially, if that area gets irritated, you're going to get referred pain to the back of the shoulder, arm, jaw, neck, because it's in that area. So it's referred pain. It's not direct blockage to the arteries, to the jaw, or anything. Correct. So I'll explain that. So we'll go over coronary circulation. But as you can see, there's a coronary map there. They're all distinct arteries in left and right heart, but they have some connections. So when one gets blocked, there's collateral circulation that can take care of it for a little while, but not too long. If all of them get blocked at the same time, those people generally do die. And that's badness. Generally, it happens one vessel at a time. Oftentimes, when one vessel gets blocked, you take them to the cath lab to see the visualization, and they see that all three are super diseased. 
in that case, they just go ahead and bypass all of them, and we'll go over the treatment in a little bit. But yeah, you're right. Like if, if the critical one gets blocked, then it's going to not function very well. The main arteries that get blocked usually are coronary arteries in the heart, carotids in the neck. They don't get blocked, but they get plaque buildup because carotids are fairly big compared to coronary arteries. Splenic, mesenteric, iliac, femoral, the diagram is up there. So we talked about this flow, turbulent flow with plaque buildup, Raynaud's number, physics nightmares, or physics happiness, whatever you guys prefer. Um, and then you guys can study that. Um, what? And then vascular system aneurysms, abnormal enlargement in the arteries caused by damage or weakness, mostly hypertension related, atherosclerosis related, atherosclerosis is just plaque buildup. And that's an MR angiogram of a real person's aneurysm. Now these are risky because they can burst, causing death fairly quickly. They can dissect into other arteries, which means they can affect end organs and cause strokes. Arm can get lost because it might go into one of the subclavians which supply the arm, things like that. So they're fairly dangerous, but when they're not too large, they're not too bad and you can just manage them medically. When they get above a certain size and you monitor them every year or something, then you have to surgically treat them or there's stents to put in those as well, like endovascular grafts and all this fancy stuff. Uh, I've seen worse, but in aneurysms in aorta are probably the most common. Next would be cerebral, I think, brain, which is linked to kidney disease sometimes. Um, so it causes hardening of arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes, syphilis can cause aortitis, which is inflammation of the aorta. So syphilis can cause everything, but we don't see all the manifestations anymore because people get treated very quickly. Great pretender. Marfan syndrome is like a disease where you see these really, really tall, thin, lanky people, really, really tall and like long, long arms and legs. Don't say everyone like that is Marfan's, but yeah. And then they get aneurysms almost always by the age of 20. It's kind of sad. They have to get multiple heart surgeries, but they have to deal with that. Um, and then valves, stenotic valves and competent valves, we talk about that. Causes are rheumatic fever, infections, wear and tear. Aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis is a common one with old age. It just kind of gets spoiled, and people get aortic stenosis when they get much older, like 80s, you know? When I say old in this case, I'm not talking about like 50. I know you guys are really young, and 50 is like old for you, but 50 is relatively young in the medical world. 60 is relatively young. 65 is young. I think 75, 70, 80 gets old in medical world somewhat, and that might be changing too. This ball and cage one is like a traditional like olden valve. It's never used now. If you see a patient with this in the OR, they get really fascinated, you know? Like these are patients who got a valve surgery at 50 years of age and now are coming back for a redo surgery at 80. And they're like, oh, there's a ball and chain in there, whatever, so it's fun. And then this is cardiomyopathy. We can discuss this more at office hours because it's kind of interesting and helps you tie in all the physiology a little bit better, but there's three main kinds. Dilated, where the ventricles get dilated. Hypertrophic, which is the one that athletes die from all the time in that sudden collapse, you know, when you hear Berkeley students suddenly collapse, like 20 years old or an athlete elsewhere, that's almost always hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the reason is that you have this, this bulge. Look at this, and look at this, and then look at that. Kind of thick, huh? The interventricular septum gets a very thick muscle because of a genetic defect in a protein that's called titan, no, what is it, titan dystrophin, I don't know what it is, something. And it basically, makes the ventricle small because it bulges into the left ventricle. And so can you, basically, less blood here. So more obstruction to blood flow, which makes their chance of getting a cardiac arrest from an arrhythmia very, very high. And that's how they suddenly collapse because in exercise, their heart can't, it just doesn't meet the requirements. That's why they screen athletes very carefully with heart exams to see if they don't have murmurs and stuff. And I think any of you, if they're athletes, you probably have checkups and uh, physicals and that's what they listen for. Uh, so they prevent that, so the rate has gone down a lot. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is from other diseases which just make the heart harder to pump out. Um, the muscle gets the problem in that case. And then heart failure is what we'll talk about, so I won't spend too much time in here. Basically, any of these heart diseases that we discussed, any of them, except maybe aneurysms, result in heart failure if untreated. Coronary artery disease or the, any of these kinds of myopathies which we discussed, they're all basically leading to heart failure at the end of it. And that, the re, that's the re, because the definition of heart failure is anything that causes the heart to not pump as it used to normally. Very simple. So any of this stuff can cause heart failure if untreated. So there are many reversible causes. So there are people who come in heart failure floridly from pulmonary embolism or something. If you fix it, their heart can be fine. Yeah.
Yeah, that's what happens in dilated cardiomyopathy. Originally, like from alcohol can give dilated cardiomyopathy to like very, very severe alcoholics. It's not very common. But so in that case, the heart it originally will try to compensate. And in that compensation is when it gets dilated, but eventually over time, it's just gonna fail. So initially a dilated heart can function fine for a while, and then it slowly, slowly fails. This is not very instantaneous. These are very gradual changes. So we'll go over that a little bit more. And then um, you guys can read this about preload after load oxygen. It's very interesting. It's kind of useful because we covered all of this, but I won't spend more time on it. Brief overview of treatments for occlusions is very easy. You take a, take a wire in from the femorals, go up the heart, and then break the plaque or a balloon or group stent deployment. And then various drugs, you guys can look at that, and you'll have to look at that for your case study assignments. I won't go over that much. And then bypass surgeries when you take a vessel from the leg or from the mammary artery, and then you create a conduit. So you, you, you basically leave the vessel like this disease, and then you create a bypass. It's cool engineering-wise, right? You just create a different circulation pathway. And where does circulation prefer? Path of low resistance or high resistance? There you go. So that's, what, that's how bypasses work. And then pacemakers for arrhythmias. We didn't talk about arrhythmias because they're very advanced, but basically even the heart doesn't function properly, we can insert these devices that help control the heart a little bit better.